All right, for the next part of this um, lecture, we'll carry on talking about magma chamber processes a little bit, and then we'll uh, talk about subduction zones. All right, so now we're going to go to the other extreme end and talk about open system processes. And there's probably way more magma chambers that I could choose for this one, but uh, I wanted to talk about the Bushveld intrusion because it's the biggest magma chamber on Earth. Like, it's pretty cool. Um, so... The Bushveld complex, um, you'll sometimes see it called complex, sometimes intrusion. Um, it's in South Africa. It's about two billion years old, and it is big enough to be a large igneous province on its own. Um, this is the largest mafic intrusion on Earth. It's about 400 kilometers across, and it's just got a colossal volume of magma in it. Um, it's a good example of some open system processes um, and the ones that we'll focus on are assimilation and recharge. Um, the starting magma was a lot more ultramafic than Skergard, and because we have recharge, then we actually see uh, repeated ultramafic cumulates in the sequence. Um, it's also got these uh, fairly interesting rock types in it. So there's uh, chromatites, which are pure uh, chromite layers, and magnetitites, which are pure magnetite layers. And these ones, particularly the chromatites, have absolutely huge PG deposits. I think I mentioned briefly before, this is 80% of the world's platinum group elements come from this intrusion. Um, and that's used for everything from you know, platinum jewelry to catalytic converters to all sorts of high-tech stuff. Um, top right, there's a map of the intrusion. And actually, even though it's, it's massive, we don't get to see the whole thing. It's only exposed in certain areas. Um, and then on the bottom right, the black stripes in this, in this rock, those are chromatites. Um, so you can see very, quite thin, but very, very continuous layers. And some of these layers, you can follow them the whole way across the intrusion. So it'll be, you know, a few centimeters thick, but, you know, 400 kilometers long, um, which is kind of crazy. Um, the parental ma uh, magma is to Bushveld. It's a little difficult to get in these big intrusions, and so... The parental melt compositions here were actually um, uh, determined by analyzing either small sills that are associated with the complex, but they, they didn't have you know, these, these massive stacks of cumulates forming. Obviously, if you're mainly accumulating olivine, if you go measure the composition, then you'll just get an olivine composition. You don't get to see what the original melt was. Um, so you can analyze these small associated sills, or there's actually areas where there's, there's a chill margin to the bushveld, and this is basically as the magma is coming in to cold uh, crustal rocks, then it freezes quite rapidly, and you get something that is pretty close to the original composition. So this is quite a high magnesium parental melt, um, and it's got high amounts of compatible trace elements, which in some of these slides I'll just write TEs, but um, just so you know. So 13 weight percent magnesium, it's high in nickel, it's high in chromium, but it's also uh, really quite rich in silica, so we have about 55% uh, silica. And if you think back to the task plot, in terms of silica, this would be an andesite. But, you know, andesites don't have 13% magnesium. So it's something else going on. Um, also has very, very high rubidium and potassium. And it has something that they call a U-shaped rare earth element pattern. And I think the U-shape is a little bit subtle. But basically, if you follow it from the heavy reverse, towards the light rare earths, it goes down at first, and then it ticks up. So the heaviest rare earths are actually slightly higher than these ones, and then everything past here is increasing. So this isn't a normal rare earth element pattern in something that we've seen from, uh, say, like a, a mid-ocean ridge basalt, um, or an island arc basalt, uh, sorry, an ocean island basalt. So the way you explain this is um, that the, the parental magmas to the bushveld had undergone a lot of crustal assimilation. And crustal assimilation, again, is where we have this a hot mafic magma coming into a magma chamber. Uh, in this case, this magma chamber must be below the bushveld because all the magmas are contaminated in the same way or assim have assimilated crust in the same way. Um, and th this hot magma actually melts continental crust and then we're adding continental crust. So the hot mafic magma to begin with, has the high MGO, it's got the high chromium, it's got the high nickel, and depleted rare earth element patterns. But then when we melt the crust, the crust has very high silica, it's much higher in incompatible trace elements. And basically, you can imagine these U-shaped patterns as a cross between something like a depleted 
mold pattern, right, where it's just going down progressively. And something like Continental Crust, which is really enriched in, uh, in light rare earths. And when we add these together, we get this, this kind of U-shape. So as I mentioned, all Bushveld magmas have already had this crustal assimilation or crustal contamination, so this happened deeper in the system. Um, aside from being you know, nearly 400 kilometers across, this magma chamber was nine kilometers thick. Um, so you get a, a sense for just quite how big it is. And if we talk about the phase layering in Bushveld, unlike Skaregard, where we just had this progressive change, and except for the olivine that reappeared, but that was with a totally different composition, there's basically just a gradual change in the minerals that we, that we see. Um, in the Bushveld, it's, it's not the case. You actually get multiple repetitions in the, in the phases. So Skaregard, you know, we went troctolite, gabbro, oxide gabbro, and so on. It's always progressing in one direction. Here we see things like it jumping between pyroxenites, uh, which are rocks that are pretty much pure pyroxene, Hartsburgites, which are olivine and orthoproxene, and dunites, which are pure olivine, and then jumping back. We also have these repeated jumps between norites, which are uh, orthoproxene and plagioclase, and anorthosites, which are those pure plagioclase cumulates again. Um, and if we focus in on the chromatites, there's a bunch of these chromatite layers that are just repeated. So multiple times we're getting just pure chromite crystallizing, which is quite weird. So to form these, there's a few different ideas for it, but basically all of them need open system processes. So we either need uh, new batches of magma coming in, we need crustal assimilation, we need, we need something that is, is not just sitting there and crystallizing in a closed system. So just to zoom in a bit on some of the stratigraphy, um, this is a very, very uh, <laughs> in-depth uh, stratigraphic log of one of the zones of the Bushveld. And here we're in the critical zone, which is uh, in the lower part of the intrusion. I think it's called critical because that's where all the, the platinum group elements are. So that's where the, the miners are interested. Um, but if you look here, we can see we're going from some sort of pyroxenite with feldspar to hartsburgite, that's olivine and orthoproxene, back to pyroxenite with feldspar, then a dunite, that's pure olivine. So this looks, you know, that's the first thing you'd expect to crystallize from a really magnesium rich melt. Then we're back to, well, we've got a bit of chromatite, back to pyroxenite, some anorthosite, uh, that's the pure, uh, pure plagioclase, norites again, pyroxenites, norites, gabbro, so it's jumping all over the place, right? And we see several times there's repeated um, compositions. So if we think back to our phase diagrams, the crystallization sequence in the Bushveld is broadly following um, this, this uh, crystallization sequence that we looked at on the forsterite anorthite uh, quartz diagram. So let's say our Bushveld parental magma is something like this one, U, which is actually really handily named for the U-shape rare earth element patterns. Um, we crystallize a bunch of olivine, then we hit some sort of olivine plus orthoperoxene peritectic, and then eventually we get down to this peritectic point and we dissolve olivine, we crystallize uh, orthoperoxene and plagioclase, which is an all right. So that's more or less the sequence that most of these magmas are following. But if we get to a point where we're crystallizing Hartsburgite, olivine plus OPX, we can't get back to this pure olivine layer unless we increase the temperature, right? And we can't do that. If we're fractional crystallization only in a closed system, we're just moving down this peritectic reaction line and we're going to end up here crystallizing all right. So to get back here, we need to add some new um, magma. Every time we go from norite to Hartsburgite or every time we go from Hartsburgite to Dunite, we have to introduce more primitive magma. So this is like the, the starting magma for Bushveld. Um, so this is what we call a recharge event, where there's, where there's new magma coming in. And we can also see the exact same thing in the mineral compositions, and this is the cryptic layering we talked about before. Here, instead of it being um, the plagioclase composition, this is the magnesium number in OPX, so orthoproxene. And if we were just doing fractional crystallization, th this is the olivine uh, binary, but OPX behaves in a very similar way. The highest temperature stuff is gonna be magnesium rich, so that'll be closer to Enstatite, um, MG2SI206. 
And the low temperature stuff is going to be closer to ferrosilite, that's the iron end member of orthoperoxene. And basically, if we're just doing fractional crystallization, this should steadily drop. And you can sort of see that in places, right? So in the, in the lower zone here, we have the Mg number steadily dropping, but then it jumps back up again. And then it steadily drops a bit, then it jumps, then it drops, then it jumps. Every one of these jumps where we go up in Mg number, we have to be adding more primitive magma to the system. Um, because we can't do that just by fractional crystallization. So there's a whole bunch of recharge events in the bush valve. Um, and the, the last really, really good evidence of uh, open system processes is the fact that we have chromatites at all. So if we're just doing simple fractional crystallization, I think you'll probably all remember that chromite is a very small volume mineral, right? We, we basically get a little bit of it when we're crystallizing olivine. So normally, for every you know, 99% plus or minus a bit olivine, we're getting 1% chromite. So to get pure chromite uh, uh, layer, a chromatite, uh, we need something special going on. So if we're doing pure, uh, just bog standard fractional crystallization, and we start with magma A, this is a phase diagram that's kind of a snippet cut out of this um, you know, magnesium and iron oxide, quartz and uh, chromium oxide. So this is, this is a bigger phase diagram, but we're just looking at a tiny corner of it. And the reason we're looking at a tiny corner of it is because that corner has olivine, it has orthoproxene, and we have mixing towards chromite, but we're just, you know, this is 1.6% chromite, because we, we, we never get much of it. So we're just looking right in this little shaded corner here. So in this field, we have liquid plus olivine. If we had more Chromite, uh, more chromium than that in the magma, then we'd be in liquid plus chromite. So if we're in this field, we just crystallize chromite and we rapidly get onto this cotactic where we're crystallizing olivine and chromite. If we're in this field, we crystallize olivine and we eventually hit this cotactic. So either way, once we're on the cotactic, we would just be going down, crystallizing an ever reducing amount of chromite. Right? It starts off with maybe like 1% chromite, 99% olivine, and as you go, you're crystallizing more and more olivine compared to the amount of chromite. If the magma got quite evolved, say this composition B here, and then we added more of this early primitive magma A, then the mixture between these two is on a straight line that actually sits completely in the liquid plus chromite field. So, if we have our evolved melt sat in the magma chamber, we get a recharge event that's got primitive melt, then we're suddenly only crystallizing chromite. So we're in the liquid plus chromite field. So this is one way of making a chromatite layer. The other thing, this magma could get even more evolved. So we've crystall we're crystallizing our dunite with very little chromite and lots of olivine. And then we eventually hit the peritectic point and we start crystallizing orthoproxene. We start reacting away our olivine and we eventually end up over here. So this one could be, at the peritectic point, we'll be making a Hartzbergite. Past it, we might be making some sort of norite, right? Um, orthoproxene and plagioclase. And then we add a new batch of this primitive melt in. Again, we're gonna force the, the mixed magma composition back into the, the pure chromite field, and we're just gonna crystallize chromatite, okay? So there's a few different models for, um, for how you make chromatites, and this, this one's maybe the easiest to understand, which is why I've gone with it, but all of them need some sort of open system process. It's either some sort of magma mixing like this, or there's an idea that you can decompress melts very rapidly, and maybe you end up just crystallizing chromatite, um, or it could be some sort of crustal assimilation thing, but what it comes down to is you need an open system process. Go ahead. Does, does magmas uh, mix well in these gigantic uh, magma chambers? Yeah, so we will, yeah, it's funny because we're going to spend the, 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 the subduction a bit talking about magmas that don't mix well, but I think when you have these ultramafic magmas, and that, that's what this is, right? Mm -hmm. It's a 13% MGO. They're very, very low viscosity. They're very hot. And so they can probably mix very, very effectively. Mm -hmm. um, if you have two magmas that have a very sharp difference in viscosity, then it would be like trying to mix... Um, I don't know, like water with honey, right? If you put some honey at the bottom of a cup and poured water on it, it will eventually dissolve, but for a while it'll just be a layer of honey and a layer of water where it's just slowly mixing at the interface. But the density is not a problem uh, that, that, 
one of the matches was the you know, top of the other one. That's a good point. Um, yeah, I'd have to think about that. I'm not sure with this exact composition, but it's it seems like they, they mix pretty well, right? Yeah. Um, there are also arguments with, with the Bushveld about whether it ever was a huge magma chamber like Skaggard. I think the prevailing idea is that, it, it, you know, if there was a single magma chamber that was very, very large. And, you know, you had new batches of magma coming in, but it was more or less always one magma chamber. The other extreme is some people think that it's just a series of stacked sills, but I don't think that's quite as widely accepted. So, yeah. Um, I think the evidence that stuff is at least... Well, I mean, maybe it's, it's, it, it doesn't have to be mixing in particularly well uh, just to create like a dunite layer, right? You could just in, have some new primitive magma coming up. It just crystallizes olivine. But to make these chromatites, we need something open system. And the easiest way to do that, or the, the easiest way for me to explain it at least, okay. is with this magma mixing. Yeah. So does, it, does that mean that a chromite can't necessarily form a curved system, or it can, but it's only so small amounts, it's only like a trace element. It, it's, it would be a, a trace mineral, right? It'd be an accessory mineral. Okay. So yeah, if um, if the original magma started in this liquid plus chromite field, then we would predict that the Bushveld would have a thin layer of chromatite right at the bottom. But as soon as you start crystallizing that chromite, you get onto this cotectic, and then you just done it, right? 99% it, olivine, 1% chromite. So it's the fact that we see these repeated layers, we need some open system process. Yeah? So after you start crystallizing the so also pyroxene, yeah. you push the melt to the left of the cosectic line, and then what happens when it goes down to H2? Does that just introduce the structure of a new melt? Or when it, oh, yeah, so, so the the if, if the melt composition, uh, when we're, we've, we've, we're done crystallizing olivine, we're now crystallizing in norite, because we can't see plagioclase on here, but it probably would be. Um, then if we mix A, then it has to lie in this mixing line. It depends how much of A we add. If we add like 90% A, it'll be somewhere down here. It's just a lever rule. If we add 10% A, then maybe we don't really get much chromatite at all. So, so it's basically the same process as well as the... Yeah, 100%, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think, I'm, I'm guessing the reason this is in here, this is to explain chromatite layers that are formed within uh, dunites or, you know, more like peridotite compositions, and there's also chromatite layers in, in more neuritic. Yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, there's totally different scare guard. Bushveld complex has a, a wide range of open system magma chamber processes. Uh, the big ones are there's the fact that it's high MGO but high silica with these U shaped rhyothelmic patterns that reflects uh, assimilation of continental crust by the hot mafic magma. Um, the fact that we see repeated cumulate layers and, and kind of jumping back in the crystallization sequence. Um, we see these reversals in crystal chemistry where the orthoperoxene is getting more um, uh, magnesium rich. Um, and the fact that we have these monomineralic rocks like chromatite, um, also magnetotite and, and probably anorthosite, all of these need additions of new primitive magma partway through crystallization. So these are recharge events. Does anyone have any more questions about that? Okay. Subduction zone time. Um, yeah, so we'll just start talking about the overall structure of subduction zones, and then we'll talk a little bit about the, the type of magmas you get uh, there, and then we'll talk more in depth about subduction zones in the next part of the lecture. So subduction zones, we already covered this very briefly in the, in the first lecture, and I hope you already know from first year that they are located around the margins of some oceanic plates. Um, they're also called volcanic arcs, and I will probably use arc fairly interchangeably, although it's, um, I probably shouldn't, it's a bit more specific. But we'll talk about arc magmatism. This is the main type of magmatism that's happening at subduction zones. And they're called arcs just because, if you look at them on a map, they're curved, right? It's not like a mid-ocean ridge where it's a straight line and then jump and then a straight line. Um, get these nice smooth curves. and. What's happening at subduction zones is oceanic lithosphere is subducting beneath either continental lithosphere, and I'll call this a continental arc, or oceanic lithosphere, and that makes island arcs. Um, so this map shows some of the uh, locations of subduction zones, and you can see there are these converging boundaries, convergent boundaries, next to oceans. So this big, thick black line 
This is the Pacific uh, Ring of Fire, where we have subduction kind of a lot of the way around the Pacific. Uh, down here, the Andes and Central America. There's arcs all over Southeast Asia through Indonesia and Japan. Um, and then in the Mediterranean, we have some kind of like leftover arcs that are, are you know, are, they're, they're just little fragments of oceanic lithosphere that's being subducted. And, and this is probably what we were seeing down in Spain. Go ahead. Just out of curiosity, like why is there so much activity in this ring and not other like mid ocean ridge like between Africa and Africa? Yeah. So I think this map um, is only showing like places where there's been kind of confirmed active volcanism. But we know that the basically the entire mid ocean ridge system is volcanically active. But um, most of it's really deep underwater and we don't get to see the eruptions, so the, the, the example I showed you in that first lecture where there was, a, there was a video of that, I think that was the first time it'd ever been caught on, on film. So it's not, it's not very common that we see these things erupting, even though we know, we know the ridges are spreading, we know new crust is forming. You know, sometimes people will drive along a ridge with a submersible, come back in five years, and there's a bunch of new lava, but they didn't see it erupt. Um, so I just think this map's a bit incomplete. All right. So the first thing to ask is like, what are we actually subducting? And I want you guys to think back to the, the lectures about mid-ocean ridges and uh, oceanic lithosphere. So the oceanic lithosphere, it comprises that, that uh, thin section of oceanic crust, which is maybe between six and eight kilometers thick, typically. Um, and the structure, we can remember it from the, uh, what we looked at in Ophiolites, is we have a layer of sediments, we have some pillow basalts, we have this sheeted dike complex, then we have our um, mafic cumulate rocks, which is mainly gabbros, and then we have some ultramafic cumulates. Um, underneath the oceanic crust, we have oceanic lithospheric mantle, and it depends a bit on how old the, um, on how old the oceanic lithosphere is, but once it's fairly old, it's gonna, it's gonna be about 100 kilometers thick similar to the thickness we talked about under Hawaii. Um, yeah, and then as the crust gets older, we're gonna have more and more marine sediment on top. Um, I just wanted to put this in because I think this is a really common misconception in geology um, about why oceanic lithosphere subducts in the first place. Um, I don't know if you were told this in first year or not, but often people will say it's about uh, formation of eclogite, right? You, you, you sub, if you put basalt at very, very high pressures, you make a metamorphic rock called eclogite, and eclogite is denser than the mantle. And so this does contribute to subduction, but it's uh, relatively minor. Actually, most of the driving force, and th this figure here is kind of a big, messy plot of density, um, but if you just do like a cross section through 100 kilometers here, then the oceanic crust is actually similar density or even a bit less dense than the kind of normal mantle around it. Um, so what's actually driving it is the fact that this slab going down is, is colder than the mantle around it. So it's, you know, if it's old oceanic lithosphere, it's, um, it's had plenty of time to cool down away from the mid-ocean ridge. And because it's colder, it's gonna be, as it subducts, it's gonna be denser than the stuff around it because hot stuff basically gets less dense. Um, so yeah, eventually once you get down to here, where it says plus garnet, then we have actually made an eclogite and now this is helping pull the slab down. But basically the slab is, is subducting because it is, it is dense. And the majority of the fact that it's dense is coming from the mantle being cold. And subduction uh, is the main driving force between, behind plate tectonics. Um, you may have also heard uh, that mantle convection drives plate tectonics, and, and this is not strictly true. Um, this is quite a famous paper from the 70s uh, where they basically just compared the speed of different plates to a bunch of different things. So if uh, mantle convection was the biggest thing, then you might expect, say, like the bigger plates, they've got more surface area to interact with mantle convection cells. Maybe they'd be moving the fastest. But actually, the, the thing that it really correlates with is the proportion of the plate boundary that's made of the subduction zone. So plates that have large amounts of subduction zone, uh, so this is the, the percentage of the plate boundary made up of trenches or, or subduction zones, um, they move really fast. 
and it's pretty much regardless of how big they are. And so out here you can see the Pacific plate, you can see the Cocos plate, which is in the Caribbean, uh, the Nazca plate, which is just uh, west of Central America. And for plates that are, base, uh, that are not really surrounded by subduction zones, they move very, very slowly. So Eurasia, North America, South America, they're mainly surrounded by, uh, by ridges, and so they move much, much slower. Um, so the distinction here is, is plate tectonics is a form of mantle convection, right? We have cold plates going down, and then there's some return flow in response to that. And subduction is actually the, the biggest driving force here. It's much more important than ridge push or any other force. All right. So in a subduction zone, um, the oceanic crust and lithosphere is sinking because it's dense. And as it's sinking, it starts to heat up. So it starts out cold, and we put it down into the mantle where it's, where it's hotter, and the plate starts to heat up. And what you can see here, these dashed lines are, are isotherms. So this is a 500 degree line up here, and this is a 1,000 degree line. And everything beneath this 1,000 degree line and on this side of the 1,000 degree line is going to be hotter. So you can see actually what, what this is showing is that cold temperatures kind of persist in the middle of the slab. It takes, it takes a long time to heat up a 100 kilometers thick lithosphere. Um, but as it does heat up, the oceanic crust is full of hydrous minerals and these get destabilized and they release fluids. These fluids get released in something called the mantle wedge, which is above the plate here. And uh, adding fluid reduces the melting temperature and this gives us flux melting. Talk more about that in detail a little later on. Um, why are there so many hydrous minerals in this subducting oceanic crust? Um, well, when you form oceanic crust at a mid-ocean ridge, it's very hot um, because we have hot asthenosphere that can upwell very shallowly because of the extension. We have a bunch of volcanism. We're making mid-ocean ridge basalts. Um, we have magma chambers quite close to the surface. And what that does is it actually sets up these hydrothermal systems so we have hydrothermal convection where cold seawater is getting drawn down into the crust. It's basically reacting with the crust, uh, strips it of a bunch of me metals, makes a bunch of hydrous minerals, and then it gets chucked out to make these black smokers that we talked about in the first lecture. So these are very, very hot fluids that have reacted with the crust. So they're enriched in metals, um, and they've left behind a bunch of hydrous minerals. Uh, all these minerals, serpentine, talc, chloride, uh, they contain a lot of water, and it's mainly as OH ions, um, so OH minus ions. Right, um, coming back to the subduction zone diagram here, oceanic lithosphere um, is actually falling at a slightly steeper angle than the slab itself, and I mentioned this in the first lecture, because it's falling at a steeper angle like this, we can't have a gap, right? So the slab is rolling back, um, and again, you can't, you can't have a gap, so the uh, arc above it actually moves with it. So this is called slab rollback, and the arc is kind of moving to stay attached to the slab, and that causes stretching in the back arc region. So overall, in an arc, we have melting in two main areas, the first one we've already talked about is this flux melting underneath the main magmatic arc. And then we also have uh, stretching, and that makes decompression melts, um, similar to what we were talking about with mid-ocean ridges in the back arc region. A couple of other things um, that I just wanted you to know the names of, um, in case it comes up in future, but I don't think we're going to talk about it too much. Um, the accretionary prism is a bit kind of in front of the arc, next to the trench, which is the, the, the deepest part of, um, of the subduction zone in terms of water depth. And at an accretionary prism, sediments are being scraped off the top of the downgoing oceanic plate. Um, and that can make these kind of quite complicated um, sedimentary uh, deposits. There'll also be, yeah, so you can have little bits of ophiolite sheared off and it, and it can be kind of messy. Um, there's also this thing called a four arc basin, which is just behind the accretionary prism. And that's um, essentially the, the, there's quite deep water here because the slab's going down um, isostatically, it's quite depressed, and we have a deep trench. 
And so that creates a big basin where you can dump sediment. That's the four arc basin. And then the mantle wedge I already briefly mentioned, but it's this little uh, kind of gap in between. It's a, a stenospheric mantle that sits in between the descending slab and the um, arc up above. Go ahead. Do you know how the Marianne Trench is that the same as like that? Like the, the yeah, the, the Marianne's Trench would be would be like here. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, why is it so deep like, compared to? Um, it's it's for a couple of reasons. So have you have you guys covered isostasy in geophysics? Yeah. So this is this is very this is relatively cold, right? And it's going down. Um, so so we have an isostatic low. And then I don't remember how important this is in, in relative terms, but there's also essentially like weight from the arc sat here. So you're basically pushing it down as well. But I, I think it's mainly isostasy. You don't have, have to check with your geophysics cross for that. So. Okay, so it's, it's, it's just heavier. Uh, yeah, this, it's, it's relatively cold here. And this is, this is bending down. So you basically just have a, yeah. But like, why is it so much deeper? Oh the Mar oh the Marianas yeah. um, in particular I don't know most trenches are really deep okay so I don't know the exact range the other thing that could be affecting it is basically how much sediment gets dumped in mm -hmm. so Marianas is an island arc isn't it so if you're next to a continent you're probably going to be shedding much more sediment into the into the forest basin and, and into the accretionary prism could also depend on the age of the lithosphere going down because if it's uh, older and colder, it might be subducting more steeply. Um, I'm not sure how that would interplay because there might also be more sediment to scrape off. But it's going to be some, some combination of the isostasy and how much sediment is, is yeah. getting in there. All right. Um, yep, subduction zones are locations where dense oceanic lithosphere subducts uh, beneath either continents, which would be a continental arc, or uh, other oceanic lithosphere, which would make an island arc. Uh, melting in the main arc is driven by release of, uh, of water from hydrous minerals in the subducting slab as they heat up and break down. Uh, this causes flux melting of the mantle wedge, so this is water-assisted melting. Melting in the back arc is primarily decompression melting, and that's caused by extension in response to slab rollback. Does anyone have any questions about that? Yeah, yeah, it's a stenosphere, yeah. So I, I'm actually personally a little confused about this. So this is drawn about as, as lithosphere here. Um, so maybe there's some bit of lithosphere, but I think the, the lithosphere gets quite thin under arcs. Um, yeah, so this will be mainly a stenosphere. This, this thing here is called corner flow. It's basically that as the slab's coming down, it's also bringing down material with it. And so you have to have some sort of something going on to, to replenish that material. Okay, but the stuff moving up would like counter flatten and then where it would, would go in the other direction. Um, I think it's more like, this is like a little convection style, right? You've got stuff coming up and across and then being drawn yeah, down. Like the, um, the melting at the stenosphere moving up is moving in the other direction. You, you're talking about here, so yeah. you've got to separate the melts from what the solid is doing. So these arrows is the direction of solid flow. The melts are going upwards, but they're not necessarily bringing solid with them. All right, um, so we'll talk a bit more in detail about flux melting and the last big magma series. We've done tholeitic, we've done alkali. Now we're going to talk about calcalkaline magmas. All right. Um, so if we look at the thermal structure of subduction zones, as I mentioned before, the fact that we're dragging down material from the surface actually means that we can, we can kind of perturb these isotherms. We can, we can have cold temperatures at much deeper depths than you can in normal mantle. So if we say this is normal mantle here, uh, at whatever, 70 kilometers, we've got 1,000 degrees C, at 150, we've got 1,400, okay? But here, um, this is, a 600 degree isotherm, and we could potentially have uh, 600 degrees at depth of, of 100 kilometers. Yeah, was that a question or? Oh, right, I thought you had it. Um, <laughs> okay, um, here's the 1,000 degree isotherm. You can see this is getting really pushed down. Um, so cold material is able to get deeper. Um, 
But it's kind of weird that we get a lot of melting, right? Because we've got, uh, we're relatively cold in the mantle wedge. And if we follow these flow lines, the wedge is not really decompressing, right? It's coming in from the side and it's actually being pushed downwards. So we, we can't really get adiabatic decompression melting in the mantle wedge. Um, the temperature inside the subducting slab uh, does depend a bit on how old the lithosphere is. Um, and so here you can see this is, this is the metamorphic kind of fasces diagram. Have you guys done metamorphics yet? I can't remember. So here we've got green schist fasces. This is you know, moderate temperatures, moderate pressures. Uh, here we've got amphibolite fasces, which is getting to a bit higher temperature. Uh, here we've got granulite, that's the really, really high temperature stuff. And up at the top we have uh, blue schist fasces. This is very high pressure with, with very low temperature. And finally we have eclogite fasces, which is high pressures at relatively higher temperatures, but it's still much higher pressure than, say, like a granulite. Um, and these different curves are the temperature that oceanic crust would, uh, would follow at a given pressure, depending on the age of the oceanic crust. So if it's quite old, 50 million years, then as it's being subducted, it goes to very high pressure without heating up too much. Um, if it's two million years old, it's fairly hot to begin with because it's just come out of a mid-ocean ridge, it hasn't had time to cool down. And it still goes to very high pressure, but the temperature at a given pressure is higher. And if it's brand new, this would be if we were, if we were subducting a mid-ocean ridge, then you can see that the, pressure, the temperature gets uh, very hot, um, even as the pressure is going up. So, Generally, plates go through some sort of, you know, blue schist fasces conditions, high pressure, low temperature, and as they subduct, they, they continue to heat up. Overwhelmingly, plates in the modern day are not going to melt, and that's because we had to basically subduct a mid-ocean ridge to get above this wet melting curve for basalt. So the oceanic crust doesn't melt as it heats up. Um, but what it does do is as we go from our kind of like mid-ocean ridge uh, hydrothermal minerals which may have formed in this kind of zeolite or crayonite pumpelliite or green schist fasces, they're, they're relatively, relatively low grade minerals. As we heat them up and as we get to higher pressures, these start to break down and we release water. Um, water has a pretty important effect on the solidus. And that is that it, it massively decreases the solidus compared to dry peridotite. So this water is being driven off the plate and into the mantle wedge above. And if we didn't have water, this would be the solidus. It, it's actually flipped compared to this, the solidus diagrams that I've shown you before. Um, temperature's still in that direction, but pressure's going up in that direction. So we've, we've flipped the vertical axis from before. But if it's completely dry, then the solidus is quite high temperature and it increases the pressure. But if we add water, there's a bunch of different measurements here, but you can see that most of them, you can actually have melting at relatively high pressures, you know, 100 kilometers depth, um, at really quite low temperatures, about 1,000 degrees. So if we add water to the mantle wedge, and the mantle wedge is, say, 1,000 degrees, somewhere in here, then we can actually melt it. Um, and so the melting is happening, we're not, we're not heating up, we're not decompressing, we are just forcing the solidus lower because of having added water. So this is called flux melting. So just to summarize what's going on here, um, the slab is descending and as it gets to higher pressure it's also gradually warming up because it's surrounded by hot mantle. Um, as it warms up and the pressure increases, those uh, low-grade hydrous minerals that were formed from the mid-ocean ridge and all the, the circulation we saw there, they start to break down. Water gets released upwards, um, and once it starts hitting a point where it's actually the mantle wedge is hot enough to, to melt once you've added water, then um, we start to get flux melting. Um, and the main arc volcanoes, which is uh, probably what we'll, we'll talk about for the rest of this lecture and uh, the, the last part of the lecture as well, um, they form above this zone of flux melting. So the exact position um, depends a bit on the temperature of the slab going down, the temperature of the wedge, how quickly the slab is descending, all these things. But basically we've got a main arc above 
this zone of flux melting. All right, does anyone have any questions on that bit before I move on? No. All right, um, if we uh, flux melt the mantle, we actually get different compositions of magmas to if we have dry melting. And the most obvious thing is that uh, wet melts have higher silica. So here's a, this is a olivine plagioclase silica ternary, um, similar to the ones we've seen before. I think the, the corners have moved around a bit, but the idea is the same. Um, if we have dry melting, then the eutectic point is somewhere here between, uh, it's, it's quite close to olivine. When we add water, we actually make olivine more stable compared to the other mantle minerals. And so the melt that forms is actually out here. So it's further away from olivine, closer to silica and plagioclase. So we actually form melts that are more silica rich. Go ahead. Does that mean that the axe ice production zones are more like full sigma composition or like intermediate or whatever? Because you would have a net wet melt. Yeah, that, um, yes. So the starting melts are not as mafic as, as at a mid ocean ridge. Yeah. More silica probably a bit less magnesium, right? We've moved away from olivine. Yeah. Um, and this lower one here is the, it's the, it's the same ternary. Again, it's been flipped. We've got plagioclase at the top now, uh, quartz at the bottom, but it's more what we'd have been used to seeing. And this is a bunch of uh, melting experiments where they melted it uh, with and without water. And so the dry melts form over here. So it's somewhere between olivine and plagioclase. Um, and the melt composition that you get depends a bit on the temperature, which in turn, controls the degree of melting, but um, essentially it's further away from quartz. These are a bunch of, of wet melting um, runs where the temperature has changed. So if we have high temperature wet melting, it's a little bit closer to the dry melts, but particularly at low temperatures, at 1000 degrees, you can actually get 20% melting by adding, in, if you keep adding water, um, but the composition that's formed here is way closer to quartz and, and plagioclase. So more silica rich, less olivine rich, so less, less magnesium. So yeah, they'll be slightly less mafic than, than mid-ocean rich. Yeah, um, so yeah, the wet melts of the mantle, um, the, the primary mantle composition, rather than being some sort of high MG basalt, it could be a basaltic andesite, um, or if the temperature is low enough, you can even get high magnesium andesites as a, as a primary mantle melt. Um, so this leads in nicely to our, our last magma series, the calc alkaline magmas. Um, and they're different for a couple of reasons. Obviously, there's water. We said we started with higher silica. Um, also, because we've added all these fluids to the mantle wedge, arc magma is actually more oxidized than typical decompression magmas, so typical mid-ocean ridge basalt. Um, and the fact that they're more oxidized and wetter and higher in silica actually changes the order of, of crystallization that we see uh, is in different minerals compared to tholeites. So the, the biggest difference is that we get really early crystallization of iron oxides, and that's because iron oxides like magnetite, they require Fe3 plus to form. So if it's more oxidized, it's easier to form a magnetite. Um, and so what that does is it means that early on in the fractional crystallization trend, calc alkaline magmas start falling in iron. And so this is, this is something called an AFM diagram. What it stands for is alkalis, sodium and potassium, uh, F is iron, and M is MgO. And if we plot a tholeitic trend on here, it starts off basically crystallizing olivine, and we move up towards the F corner because um, Iron is uh, incompatible in olivine, uh, sorry, it's more or less not compatible or incompatible in olivine. Once we start crystallizing clinoproxene and plagioclase, iron actually gets enriched. So iron goes upwards until we start crystallizing op oxides and then it drops. But in a calc alkaline magma, we start off already crystallizing oxides. And so iron is always dropping. Um, so M is going down at magnesium because we're crystallizing olivine, clinoproxene, that kind of thing. Iron is going down because we're always crystallizing oxides. So we can separate them on this, on this diagram. Okay, what, what is the uh, like purple line in between? Oh, that's just the, the dividing line, sorry, between okay. tholeitic and calc alkaline. Yeah, 
So what that means in, in terms of major elements is if we look at the tholeitic um, differentiation, and this is just that East Pacific rise mob that I, that I showed you beforehand, um, crystallizing olivine, then we start crystallizing clinoproxene and plagioclase, and basically the iron goes up and up and up, and it would if a more evolved melt composition than this, we're at 5% MgO, then it would start to drop because we'd get iron oxides crystallizing. Um, for a calc alkaline series, and this is from uh, Marie, who's a PhD student here, um, it's, iron's just dropping the whole time. And here, notice that it's, this is using silica as a differenti differentiation index. The reason for this is because these are arc magmas. They're not mega high in, in magnesium, so the, I think the most primitive ones are like 8% magnesium. And so silica is a bit more useful to show the differentiation. But as we're crystallizing, it's always dropping iron. Um, whereas in tholeites, it goes up at first and then it drops later. Um, in terms of the task plot that we looked at last week, uh, calc alkaline magmas are not particularly distinguishable from tholeitic magmas on, on the task plot. So that's our to total al alkali versus um, silica. And you remember that there's this um, alkaline subalkaline boundary. So all the alkaline magmas are to the left and above this. And all the tholeitic magmas are down in this area. And here, this is this main arc field. These are Andes uh, main arc volcano compositions. Most of them fall in the subalkaline field. So we can't really tell them apart from tholeites using this. Um, but you'll notice in the back arc, and again, this is from An the Andes, uh, in the back arc region where we have that decompression melting, some of them do actually fall in the alkali basalt field. So in general, in the main arc, we get calcalkaline magmas and sometimes tholeitic, which I'll talk about in a sec. And in the back arc, we get either tholeitic or alkaline magmas. And that's because the back arc is, is further away from this zone of like fluid addition, and we're getting decompression melting instead of that fluid flux melting. Um, yeah, just the last note on this is that calcalkaline magmas are almost always found in arcs but not all arc magmas are calcalkaline. Um, we basically are more, we're more likely to get calcalkaline magmas where we have a uh, thicker crust in the overriding plate, so basically continental arcs. And in some island arcs, you can actually get uh, tholeites, and, and these are referred to as island arc tholeites, um, in the main arc. So there's some, yeah, when the crust is thicker, we're more likely to get calcalkaline. Um, I think that's all I had to say about that. All right, so subduction zones are mostly too cold to melt dry mantle and we're not having any decompression anyway. Instead, they melt by flux melting, it's fluids driven off the subducting slab react with the mantle and reduce the solidus. Yes, Oscar? Um, well, when you say that the crust has to be thicker than metal, what kind of crust is this? Um, I don't know. Okay. I believe, it's, I believe it's thickness, so that would probably tell you it's something to do with the, the pressure of, of the melting. Um, but yeah, go ahead. Why, why did you say you get more foliatic magma composition in the island arc uh, subduction zone? Um, because you do. <laughs> yeah, and so so it's what I was trying to say is that we will, if you if you find a calc alkaline magma, you can be quite confident that it's come from an arc. But if you find an arc, it doesn't mean it's always going to have calc alkaline magmas. And essentially, the, the thinner the crust, the more likely you are just to get like a, a tholeitic composition. Uh, even though it's, it's, it's still flux melting, but you get these island arc tholeites. And if you have thick crust, then you get calcalkaline magnus. Okay, but yeah, are, are you going to explain why, why that is? Or? <sighs> no, because I'm not really sure myself. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you'll probably tell I'm not a subduction zone expert. Um, all right. Um, yeah, so when we get this flux melting, we're often producing calcalkaline magmas. Um, there, might, there might be something in the next part of the lecture which could maybe explain it, but I, I don't know enough about it, to be honest. Um, so just like tholeites, these are subalkaline, right? They're, they're relatively high in silica compared to the amount of alkalis. Um, but they're more oxidized, and that means that they crystallize iron titanium oxides earlier, and this, this produces changes in the geochemistry compared to tholeites. Does anyone have more questions about that? Sorry, I can't give you a better explanation. On <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think that's all we had. So uh, I'll just leave up the, the summary for a sec. Um, we've got 10 minutes again, so.